Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, I'm Kim, alcoholic. Hi, Thanks for having me speak tonight. Um... So my sobriety date is May 23rd, 2014, and my home group is Empire Way. Um, my drinking career, um, really towards the end of my drinking, I drank one to two bottles of wine every night, every, every day, 365 days a year for about 10 years. Um, and of course, you know, throwing some good weekends and some vacation, and let's just say I've heard that I've broken records at restaurants um, for drinking, in, especially in foreign countries. So I, uh, I, I had a pretty solid wine problem. Um, but what's interesting is that I never drank in high school, and I didn't drink a lot in my early 20s. It was this constant, slow progression that just kept layering and layering and layering itself. Um, and really the last few years of my drinking was just exhausting. Um, but what's interesting to me is that nobody ever confronted me about my drinking problem. My husband didn't really think it was an issue because I opened the second bottle by the time he went to bed. So he didn't really notice, um, that I was, you know, going into bottle number two at 10 o'clock at night. Um, and I didn't hide bottles because every day I would just stop by the liquor store on the way home and pick up a couple bottles of wine. And that seems pretty normal, right? Um, I had a job. Nobody confronted me at that. Um, and my job also required lots of happy hour and travel and that sort of thing. So everybody drank. And I also lived in Manhattan, so I didn't have to drive. I lived there for about seven years. Um, so I didn't have a DUI. So all these things compounded like, well, I don't really have a, I'm not an alcoholic. I just drink a lot. Um, and so I never truly confronted the problem because nobody ever came to me and really identified that I had a problem. Um, some moments that started to stand out to me is that my very close friend who we travel with all the time, another couple nicknamed me PB and that's personal bottle. So anytime we went to restaurants, when we traveled, Everybody would order their cocktail, but I would order my own bottle of wine. And this often threw the servers at the restaurants. They could not understand, like, well, do I bring more glasses? I'm like, no, 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 I, j I just want the bottle of wine. And it constantly dumbfounded them. And then that was becoming my nickname. I mean, who wants a nickname called personal bottle when you travel? <laughs> it's not really ideal. Um you know, some other things, too, is I thought, hey, you know, I just need to get healthier. So I started to join a triathlon club in New York City. Um, but one of the moments that I knew that I was struggling is that we would often have early morning workouts. And on one of the runs, it was like three miles or something to that effect. I broke down crying because I was so hungover. I could not keep up with the group. I was just miserable. I was deeply hungover and sick. And this woman I was running with, she was like, it's not a big deal. It's only three miles. I'll get you through it. It's fine. I'm like, you don't understand. I, I can't physically do this anymore. I literally stopped this five-month training program that I had to raise thousands of dollars for charity. And I had to drop out because I had a drinking problem. And I had to admit it to her that I, I, I can't do this because I can't drink until two o'clock in the morning and get up with a bunch of healthy people and try to, and try to do this. I had this weird dichotomy. I wanted this life that was fresh and sparkly and healthy and positive and, you know, high achieving. But I would also have these dark moments every night of just losing myself and numbing out and drinking at night. Um, another time that was kind of a, a real low point for me is that I went, moved back to Seattle and then I had a business trip to New York city and I stayed at this really cool hotel called the Ace Hotel in New York. You know, there's one in Seattle it has this fabulous bar. Um, and I went to dinner 
course, I had some drinks in my room, then went out to dinner with some colleagues, went back to, to the bar by myself at like 11 o'clock at night, stayed in the bar until about 2.30 in the morning, kept drinking. I don't even know how many drinks I'm probably in. Maybe seven, eight at this point. 2.30 rolls around. I go back to my hotel room. I continue to drink. And I was up until about four o'clock in the morning, just still drinking wine, having my own little private party in my room, playing music, having a blast in my own head. Um, but I had a 9 a.m. meeting the next day that I was presenting to 10 people who I'd never met before. Um, and it was an agency that we hired and I had to lead the meeting. And I mean, I can whip it together and I can get as polished as possible but it was rough. I mean, I, I couldn't hold a coffee cup. I mean, I'm sure everybody's felt this way, but I couldn't hold a coffee cup. I could barely get through my conversation. I was stuttering the whole time and I was mortified. I just, I wanted to get through the meeting so I can get the hell out of there. It was one of the most humiliating experiences just because I could barely function through the meeting, but I was gritting my teeth, doing everything I can to just get through this. Um, I could only survive on Gatorade for about 24 hours because I was so sick. Um, and the next day I met friends for drinks and felt great again and went back to my life. You know, it was, it was like nothing had happened. I knew it was bad, but it's like, you know, I'd just have another drink. What am I saying the next day? I went out that night. What am I saying? <laughs> so I went out that night and had drinks and, you know, it was like life just got right back to normal. But I knew that the wheels were about to come off the bus and somebody once said in a meeting that you really don't want to try to find your rock bottom. Again, I never had, I never had the, the DUI and the falling downstairs and the broken arms and that sort of thing. But I had a heaviness over me that was almost debilitating. I, I would wake up in the morning just losing my grip and having anxiety that I almost couldn't take anymore. My self-loathing was just taking over me. Um, so I did what anybody would do. I went to yoga and I, again, joined a gym and I bought as many self-help books as I could possibly find. I went to a therapist and it's like, I just have all these stresses in life. I just have a lot of stress in my life. And I just need some help, right? I just need some help. Um, and, you know, I'm not an alcoholic. I don't have alcohols in my family, which is funny because when you really start looking around, uh, I actually have found a lot more family members that are alcoholic, which surprised me. Um, but, you know, so I went to therapy. I went to a couple of different therapists, and it's shocking how it was great. After a while, my, my therapist said, you have a you're an alcoholic. You need to go to AA. This is, you're wasting our, my time. You're wasting your time. You have to go to AA. And I was like, Oh my God, that's the last thing. Like I can't, I can't do this. I can't be in church basements. I can't go. Um, I just, I didn't want that label. I didn't want to be known as an alcoholic. Um, cause I didn't have any friends. I didn't know anybody. I, I, I had no connection to AA whatsoever. Um, so I went to my first meeting in New York city it was like this circle of maybe 12 people. I walked in and it was something out of like a Woody Allen movie. Like everybody was like super buddy, buddy and kind of like little rough and tumbled around the edges. I lived on the Upper West Side. It's just, it was an interesting meeting. And I sat right next to um, the leader, the moderator, and everybody went around and said, I'm an alcoholic. And I said, I'm an alcoholic. And I couldn't stop crying. Um and I tried to go back to that meeting a few times, but it just, it was not the right fit for me. And I, I didn't know, I didn't know you could find different, I thought that was how all meetings were. I didn't know. So I went to one or two other meetings, um, but it, it didn't feel good to me. I didn't find relief. I didn't find people I could identify with. So for the next four years, I just kind of drifted in and out. I went sober six months. I was white knuckling it. I was like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to stay sober. And then I'd relapse again. And I did that for about four years. And let me tell you, it's a purgatory is how I felt. It's was a colossal, I just feel like I wasted so much time. Um, 
So then I had, I came back to Seattle and I started to get more serious about this. I knew that I needed to address this and I started to go to meetings. Um, I found a sponsor. I, I knew I needed to take this seriously. I was becoming willing. I hadn't surrendered, but I became willing. And so I found a sponsor and it, it didn't, it was not the right fit. She was super tough. <laughs> um, she was, you know, the 90 and 90 and, um, you know, call me every day and do all this homework and that kind of thing. And I was just barely like doe eyed, like, I don't know if I can do this. And she was like, this isn't going to work out. I'm sorry. You're not, you're not turning everything over to this. And so it's not going to work out for, for her and for me. So I was like, fine, I'll just kind of drift in and out of the rooms. Um, I'll just try this thing on my own. I'll just go to, you know, one meeting here and there and just see how it goes. And I went 11 months sober and I had a big trip to New Zealand planned with our friends again, same friends that we travel a lot with. Um, and I actually, we, I picked New Zealand because I thought, hey, it's going to be the outdoors. It's going to be hiking. We planned a hiking trip. It's like, you can't drink hiking. It'll be great. I mean, I, I thought, hey, I could get sober camping. I mean, that's ridiculous, right? <laughs> um, I really thought that. I was like, if I go camping, I can get three days sober. Um, went the month before New Zealand, I literally was like, I, I can't go on a vacation without drinking. I can't do this. And I, I relapsed um, because I didn't have a sponsor. I didn't go to meetings. And I relapsed. I said, there's no way I'm going on an international vacation and not drink. Um, and again, I picked up right back where I started again. Um, and let me tell you, by the way, I have been in countries, the most remote places in the world. Truly, I've been in the Sahara Desert. There is alcohol. You can find alcohol on a mountaintop. I went hiking on a mountain that they brought in supplies by helicopter because it was so remote, no roads. There's a full bar. So <laughs> I thought that, you know what, if you go somewhere remote, or if I could just will myself into, you know, go places that doesn't have alcohol, you can find alcohol anywhere. I mean, we, we all know that. Um, and so I came back and I knew again, it's like, I can't do this anymore. I was exhausted. I was sick and tired of counting glasses of wine at the dinner table. And where's the waiter? And where's my wine? And what time does the store close? And how do I, I couldn't do it anymore. So I surrendered. And again, that word sounds kind of corny, and I know we talk about it, but I really had to surrender. And I found a sponsor. I found a group of women that I felt got me. Um, again, I cried for the first six months, and I went through the steps. I met with my sponsor once a week. I still talked to her almost every day. I go to two to three meetings a week. I now sponsor, have a sponsee who's in her first 45 days. And after truly just going through the steps, following direction and nothing that's unreasonable. I found a sponsor who she got me. I get her. I know how she works. It's it. She's not, she's a friend, but she's also a mentor of the program. And I finally found that relief and that peace that I had been looking for for years, many, 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 many years. And, you know, it's still tough. You know, you hear the saying life on life's terms, and that's absolutely true. There are many moments that I'd love to, you know, crack open and celebrate a glass of champagne at somebody's wedding. But you know what? I, I know that I'm not going to act like an idiot at that wedding. I'm going to feel great the next day. I'm going to be a person that that bride is proud to be next to. Whereas if I was drinking, who knows what would happen where that night would take me. So what I found is that, you know, this program works if you just follow the simple steps. And I, di I didn't necessarily have the big pink cloud aha moment of finding the God of my, my choice but it slowly has come to me. And I mean, slowly, but I just literally, when somebody asks for help, I say, yes. When somebody says, come to meetings, I go. When my sponsor says, call me, I do. I just follow those very basic principles and I don't have to drink today. And it's a hell of a lot easier to do this than it is to white knuckle it, 
to hope for this to go away. Um, so yeah, thank you. I'm Jerry and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Jerry. And, uh, my, uh, Home group is the uh, Last Chance group on uh, 78th and Greenwood on Friday nights. I've been going to that one for quite a few years. Uh, my sobriety date is May 31st, 1981. And uh, so I've been sober for 34 years and, and quite a bit, a little over that. And, uh, you know, I, I'd just like to start off with uh, a friend of mine uh, named David. Uh, a lot of the older people here know him remember him. He died a few years ago. But he used to tell a lot of really stupid jokes. And uh, I always like to put one out for him just to remember him, you know. He he went to work one day with, with two black eyes, and one of his co-workers said, where'd you get that black eye? And he said, I got it in church. He said, well, how'd you get that in church? And he said, well, we stood up to sing a hymn, and the lady in front of me, uh, her dress was stuck up uh, about halfway up her butt crack. <laughs> And he said, it looked really uncomfortable, so I reached up and yanked it out, and she turned around and punched me right in the eye. He said, well, where'd you get the other one? And he said, well, the next time we stood up to sing a hymn, I figured she must have wanted it there, so I shoved it back where I found it. <laughs> <No. laughs> and uh, David had a million of those, and he told them all the time. <laughs> uh, <you know. laughs> uh, anyway, I uh, I moved around a lot. Uh, you know, I uh, I was born in Seattle. And uh, my dad worked for the federal government for uh, Veterans Administration, and he wanted to get a better job. Uh, you know, this was right after World War II, uh, not too long after that. And uh, to get a better job, you had to wait for the, uh, the uh, manager to die or transfer to somewhere else. So we uh, transferred to uh, Minneapolis. And uh, I was, uh, did the uh, first and second grade in Minneapolis. And then uh, after that two years, uh, he transferred again, and we went to the really nice city of Minot, North Dakota. That's where they invented ice, I think, and deep snow. <laughs> I was there for the third and fourth grade, and then uh, we transferred one more time, and uh, we went to uh, Santa Monica, California. It was uh, 1955. It was the year Disneyland opened, and we got there just in time to get to that. And uh, although the one thing that I think that, that moving around did as a small child, I, I always remember being extremely uh, shy and bashful. I was one of those people I wouldn't say shit if I had a mouthful. People were always asking me, you know, uh, has the cat got your tongue? And I go, what the, what the hell does that mean, you know? <laughs> I don't have a cat. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I wouldn't... Uh, uh, you know, going through school, uh, you know, I went from the uh, fifth grade through uh, high school in Santa Monica and a couple of years of uh, uh, college. And, uh, you know, if I had to give a book report, I'd just as soon have somebody take me out and just beat the shit out of me. I wouldn't do it. I never, uh, I never got up in front of a class ever to give any kind of a report or anything. I just couldn't do it, you know. And so, uh, you know, something like this would be uh, would be a big. I, w I wouldn't do it. But uh, you know, fortunately for me, Alcoholics Anonymous has given me a whole bunch of stuff that I didn't expect to get when I got here. Uh, I drank for about 22 years, and uh, used other other things as well. But uh, alcohol was my primary thing. And after I quit all the other things, I couldn't quit alcohol. And so that was my major problem. And uh, I did a lot of uh, a lot of geographics. Uh, I lived in uh, Santa Monica for quite a few years, got married, and uh, we bought a new, brand new house in San Juan Capistrano in 1976. It wasn't finished being built before when we bought it and moved down there. And uh, I had a job in uh, Santa Monica area, but it's kind of a stretch to drive back there from San Juan Capistrano. <laughs> you know, so we, you know, I did that on faith. You know, we just moved there and uh, hope in the hopes that there was other people there had jobs. Might as well find one there too. So 
uh, we had that I had that place for about two years, and uh, you know I was getting pretty squirrely because uh, my drinking was catching up to me then. And even though I was in my uh, you know mid mid twenties, early thirties, uh, the drinking was really catching up with me. And so we, I, I kind of it was a, a kind of a two part problem. I decided we should move someplace where the grass is greener would really be a lot better. So uh, we sold the house and moved to Detroit. <laughs> yeah, I, I did a lot of geographics, but I never really did any did any research on them. <laughs> you know, and uh, that, it, it, that always seemed really good when you think about it. You know, after how many beers or bottles of wine or whatever, you know, anything sounds like a good idea. But uh, we got there, and uh, actually, the, the main reason we went there was because the uh, the wife's. Uh, her mom had died four years earlier, and her dad had this manufacturing company in Detroit, and we bought it out from the rest of the family. And uh, that was the other reason we moved there. And uh, the last, uh, that was turned out to be about the last four to four and a half years of my drinking. Uh, we moved there in uh, 1978, and, uh, you know, I, I was mostly a beer drinker up until that point, but... Uh, yeah, the beer just didn't have enough alcohol in it for me, so I switched over. And and I hate to say what I drank at the end of my drinking, because if I'd have known, I'd be standing up talking to people in AA meetings for the rest of my life. Uh, peppermint schnapps wouldn't have been my choice of drink. <laughs> I know it sounds really lame. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know... Uh, I bought a bottle of it once when I was on a business trip in California, and it was that real syrupy, sweet stuff. It was like cough syrup, and the stuff they had in Detroit was just this real cheap vodka, and it had like one drop of peppermint in it. And, uh, you know, you drank, and they had half pints there. So what happened in the last uh, year or so of my drinking, you know, I, uh, the wife decided that I should go to a treatment facility a couple of times, and... Uh, there wasn't too many of them around then, but uh, you know, I, I got I, I got ready to check into one, and the uh, insurance that we had wouldn't uh, wouldn't cover that one. And I said, "Oh, too bad," you know. <laughs> so so uh, yeah, couldn't do that. So I put it off for you know maybe another year or two, and uh, finally, about three years later, I really wanted something, and I didn't know what to do. And um, I had a uh, brother-in-law that's a psychiatrist that lives in Detroit. And so I figured he must know what was wrong with me. Uh, he was a, kind of a fun guy. We did a lot of stuff together and uh, you know, with his wife and with my sister, sister-in-law. And um, he was a real character and a lot of fun. And he was one of those people that couldn't drink because if he drank, if he, if he had like one, one drink, or two drinks, he got a splitting headache, and he couldn't drink anymore. And so I figured he probably knew what was wrong with me, and, and he, he did. He knew I was an alcoholic, and I didn't know that. You know, I, I tried uh, quitting drinking a lot of different ways, but I really didn't. I, didn't, I wanted to quit drinking, but I didn't want to get sober to do it. You know? <laughs> and uh, so anyway... Um, the last uh, last year or two of my drinking, this uh, factory that we owned was on a dead end street in a uh, real bad part of Detroit because it was a heavy industry business. So those are in the, the worst parts of town that you can get. And uh, I was driving a Cadillac at the time, and uh, I'd stop at this liquor store that was uh, the only one in, around work that was open at seven o'clock in the morning. And I'd stop there on the way to work and pick up a half pint of peppermint schnapps. I'd pull around the corner, and uh, just before I pulled into the parking, I'd drink the whole thing straight down. And uh, that way I could walk into the walk into my uh, office, and I'd be sober. I'd sit down, and a couple minutes later, I would say, God, I hope I don't have to get up and do anything, because I can't walk, you know, <laughs> can't sit, can't, can't do much after that. But uh, when I make a turn on there, I'd uh, take the uh, window, roll the window down, and I'd take the half pint and I'd throw it over the window into a snowbank on the 
side of the road, right right by our parking lot. And then at uh, about nine o'clock, I'd go out and see one of the vendors that we dealt with, and uh, really it was a ploy so I could stop at the liquor store down the street that opened at ten o'clock, and I'd get another uh, half pint there and uh, do the same thing. I'd come back to work and I'd go up, uh, go out and make that same turn, and I'd roll the window down and flip it over the car into the snowbank. And then uh, at noon, I'd go out for lunch, but uh, I went to a place that didn't serve food. They just served, well, maybe unless you call uh, Slim Jims and pickled eggs food. <laughs> uh, so, and then at uh, about two or three in the afternoon, I'd go to this other liquor store that was open most of the day. And, you know, I thought if I, I didn't want to go to one liquor store because I figured they'd figure out I was an alcoholic or had a problem with drinking. So I never caught on to the fact that now there's four of them that know I'm an alcoholic. You know? <laughs> so I never caught that part of it until after I got sober. And uh, you know, I've met a lot of other people in AA that did the same thing. You know, We just didn't get it. Uh, you know, <laughs> I hid alcohol everywhere, and the only people that was fooled was me, <laughs> especially when I couldn't find it. But uh, I'd come around that corner again, you know, in the afternoon and flip that bottle over the, over the, uh, into the snowbank. And, uh, you know, I cut to the chase here. I got sober in the springtime. <laughs> when I came around that corner one day and the snow was gone and there was this huge pile of bottles sitting there. And my wife had taken all these bottles and put them in a big box and stuck them on my desk. And when I walked in the door, everybody everybody scattered. Nobody wanted to look at me. Nobody made eye contact. They were all, oh, shit, you know, shit's going to hit the fan now. And, of course, I denied drinking any of that crap, you know. I wouldn't I wouldn't drink that swill, but, uh, you know. And uh, I tried making a call to, uh, to the uh, psychiatrist uh, brother-in-law. And I couldn't dial a phone. It was a push-button phone, and I couldn't dial it. So I had to have a secretary dial it, and then I ran upstairs and got it and uh, asked him what I should do. And he said, he said, well, there's a treatment facility that he was connected to that he was a consultant at. And I called them up, and they said, uh, you can check in next Monday. But uh, and they, then they gave me the best advice I ever heard. They said, don't stop drinking until you get here. So I thought that was sound advice. <laughs> so, yeah. And uh, my brother-in-law also said, uh, you know, he said, if you go to this treatment place and, uh, you know, do the 28 days there and stay sober for six months or a year, you can probably be a restored to a normal drinker. And I thought that was a great idea, too. You know, so that, that got me in there. And, uh, you know, I went through that program, and uh, I got an A in treatment. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, after I got out of there, you know, I uh, started going to, I was going to, I told them I was going to go to as many as maybe one meeting a month. You know, I was going to get real and in, real involved in AA, and uh, the first day I was uh, I was home. Well, I got to back up a little bit. The uh, the third day I was in the treatment hospital. The uh, wife came by and dropped off divorce papers, and because uh, things weren't going too good at home anyway, uh, we had two small kids, two uh, two daughters, and uh, so I got the divorce papers. Uh, I found it's kind of hard to hire a lawyer when you're in a treatment for alcoholism. You know, they, they don't really want to show up, <laughs> show up and get hired. And so, uh, and then the, uh, then she changed the uh, phone numbers so that I couldn't talk to either one of the kids. And then she moved her boyfriend into the house. And by the time I got out of the treatment uh, hospital, she gave, uh, gave my, the boyfriend my car. So, you know, I had a lot of things to talk about there. I had some issues, <laughs> so, some major issues to go by. And, uh, you know, things were, uh, it was supposed to get better when you get sober, you know. It didn't get so much better. But uh, when I look back on that now, I uh, if that wouldn't have happened exactly that way, I probably wouldn't be here today, you know. And uh, it just didn't seem like it at the time. 
But uh, what happened to me is I started going to a lot of meetings, and since I didn't have a car, I started walking to them. And, uh, you know, I went to a few meetings, and uh, there's a, a, a couple old-timers that uh, I think one of them had been sober like maybe eight years, and the other one maybe six months. They were old-timers to me. And uh, they said, do you think you can go to 90 meetings in 90 days? And I thought, God, that's... I was still really pretty foggy, and I'm, I'm trying to multiply 90 times 90 to see how many meetings that would be. I didn't, I just didn't get it, you know. So, and yeah. and uh, one of the other guys said, "Okay, we have an optional program for the intellectuals. Do you think you can go to one meeting a day for three months?" And I thought, well, fuck, "That's easy. I'll take option two. So I managed to do that. Uh, but after I started doing that. Uh, it worked out better for me if I, uh, since I didn't have a job. Uh, she also uh, blocked my unemployment. So actually, when I stepped out of the hospital, I had uh, had about forty dollars in cash in my pocket. All the bank accounts were closed. I had nothing, and uh, fortunately, uh, we had bought my mother a, a house. So I had she had a spare bedroom, and I could stay there. But uh, that wasn't what I was really looking for at that point point of time in my life. And uh, so what happened is uh, instead of going to uh, ninety meetings in you know ninety days, I went to about three hundred meetings in ninety days, and I continued that for the first year. And uh, that really helps out, especially if you don't have a job and you get home from one meeting and you just sit on your hands until you can go to another one because you got really nothing going for you. I got a sponsor right off the bat, and uh, that was good for me. Uh, about 19, just after I was about sober, about nine months, uh, my unemployment was starting to get running out. There wasn't any jobs in Detroit in 1981. For the same reason, there's no jobs in Detroit today. Uh, so I, re I was forced to move. So I called a few friends in California and asked if I could get a job back here. And they said, "And they said, sure, no problem. There's plenty of jobs." So I uh, moved back to uh, California, and I moved to Huntington Beach, where I'd never lived before, but uh, it sounded like a good idea. It turned out to be a, a pretty good place. Uh, the sponsor I ended up with uh, owned a little tiny machine shop, and uh, I was I started a couple of meetings there because I was had some spare time, and uh, I'd gone to a central office to get some literature for a meeting. Stopped by his shop, and his one employee had quit and wrote a "screw you" notice under the door with a key on it, and he didn't know what he was going to do. I'd worked in uh, automotive stuff before, and did well at it, but I. I kind of wanted to change, so I said, well, you know, maybe I could learn how to be a machinist. Maybe I could work here. So uh, he gave me a job, and I worked for him for eight years. And, uh, you know, I about 1989, I decided it was getting a little pricey in California. It was too crowded. So I did something. I, I figured I was going to try a geographic, and I did it, I did it a, a different way. I actually researched it. I was from Seattle. I spent a lot of time up here, you know, as a kid and off and on. So I flew up here. I flew up to Seattle for uh, a week and uh, checked out some jobs. You know, turned down a bunch of resumes. And I, the main thing I did is I went to a lot of AA meetings. I stayed with one of my aunt and uncles in Lake City, and I went to. Uh, a couple of meetings a day, they dropped me off and let me use a car and go to them. And uh, that was my primary thing, because I was sober eight years when I moved here in 89. And I thought, if I don't like AA here, there's no there's no point in moving here. Mm -hmm. So I, I got AA here, and I liked it. It was wor it was working well for me, so I moved up here. And uh, it's proved to be a really good move for me. Uh, I've been working now for the uh, same company for 24, a little over 24 years. Uh, I started for this little startup company. It was kind of over by the U Village. And uh, I started there in 1991. And there was uh, 15 people that worked there then. Now there's uh, over 800 people. And we, we've taken over Muckleteo. 
<laughs> we build uh, gigantic machines for assembling airplanes. Uh, we're in the news quite a bit, and uh, we're building uh, all the machinery for making the new wings for the 777 and a bunch of other airplanes. We work for Airbus. For, we're, we're all over the world, and it's, uh, I think they turned a billion-dollar profit, of, uh, started doing a billion dollars of business uh, a couple of years ago. And when I started there, the $100,000 a year was a big, big profit. So it's really moved a long ways. And uh, they pay us all really well. And uh, it's a real goofy company. They have no bosses. Uh, the, the owner figures that if everybody will, if he hires quality people and they come in and uh, you let them do what they do best and leave them alone, that the cream will rise to the top. <laughs> okay, Some, sometimes it does. It also it also brings in a lot of flaky people, but you know, and then they keep them forever. But uh, you know, I, I'm not one of them, <laughs> but I have to work around them a lot. And it's a real goofy place to work. Uh, we've got a bunch of drunk people working there, and they don't do they don't do uh, UAs or anything. He also believes in just leaving people alone, which is. You know, that's fine until you get this thing called litigation. <laughs> he hasn't been sued yet, but, you know, someday it's got to happen. But it's been an interesting job, and uh, I still have a lot of fun doing it. And, uh, you know, I'm getting uh, I'm getting past the poll date for work, and I'm, I turned 70 this, uh, this year, earlier this year. They uh, tried to get rid of me. Uh, in 2009, sent an email that I was too old to work there and I should quit. And uh, I happened to have a my wife has a sponsee that uh, works in a high-powered law firm downtown, and I was laughing and talking to her about it. And she happens to know the chairperson for the uh, Washington State uh, lawsuit department for you know age discrimination. <laughs> she sent him two letters he didn't talk to me for three years it's the, it's the best three years I had working there everybody left me alone I could do anything nobody said anything to me <laughs> now I'm back to normal again but you know it's still fun and uh, you know I have a really good life today uh, I have a lot of fun and uh, I didn't know what I was going to get when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous. It didn't, uh, you know, the book didn't make any sense to me. The only parts of the book that made sense was uh, uh, Dr. Paul's story about how when he got home from work, he'd uh, pull into the garage. He was a doctor, and he'd pull into the garage and uh, pull out his sodium pentothal and a, and a syringe and decide how much of that he could shoot up run down the hall, jump in bed, and fall asleep. And I thought that's the most brilliant thing I ever heard of. But, you know, most people can't get sodium pentothal you know, <laughs> when, they're, when they're still drinking. But I thought, you know, that, that made sense to me. But the rest of the book didn't make sense for quite a while. And, uh, you know, today it makes perfect sense all the way through. You know, and uh, this, uh, this program has really changed my life, you know, uh, Today I can get up in front of a group of people and feel really comfortable speaking, you know. So that's that's something huge for somebody that couldn't do this at all before. And uh, you know, there's also some downsides to it. I've got two daughters that are uh, one's forty, the other's forty four, and they're both pretty dysfunctional because of the the, the crap that we put them through. And uh, you know, I would. I, I would hope they would be better off now, but uh, the older one is, is doing fairly well. She's pretty much self-supporting through her own contributions. The other one's not. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we had a really bad morning uh, Saturday, uh, about 4 o'clock Saturday morning. The younger daughter, she just got out of jail. She'd been in jail for uh, about two and a half, three months for a DUI. And then uh, the jail time is for failure to comply, like uh, come in and give a piss test and, you know, it's got heroin in it and all kinds of other things, and they don't like that. So uh, they locked her up once, and she got out, and then uh, she failed, failed the test again, so they put her in for 120 days. 
And she was uh, in for most of that, and they let her out a week ago, Friday. And Saturday morning at 4.30, uh, 4.30 in the morning, we let her stay in the house for uh, two days. And we go, okay, well, give her the benefit of the doubt. Wrong answer. <laughs> she uh, did some heroin and overdosed, and uh, her boyfriend's running up and down the hall, and, you know, he... Uh, took a big can of water and threw it at, threw it on her, you know, and I go, like, that, that doesn't work, you know, now you're going to drown her, you know. So she was laying on the floor totally unresponsive and out and, uh, you know, clinically dead. We, he didn't know what to do, and I said, well, I do. Call 911 and start giving her CPR. So the fire department, we looks like we had the whole Ballard Fire Department in our living room and uh, a couple of cops, and, uh, you know, she was clinically dead, laying there on the floor, and uh, they gave her some uh, that Narcan. But that shit's amazing, you know. 30 seconds later, she sits up and is like, who are you people and what am I doing here? You know, it's just like, you know, one minute you're dead and the next minute you're just, you know, right back to normal again. But they did take her to the hospital. Uh, I guess they have to watch them for a while and give them more shots of that if they have to. But, uh, you know, family problems are, and other problems are still there, even if you stay sober. You know, uh, problems never go away, but uh, we do have ways to deal with them here. And, uh, you know, I know enough people in Alcoholics Anonymous that have the same, same problems that I have and the same problems that other people have, you know, and we talk to them and see how they handle it, what they do with it. And, uh, you know, the way we handle it now is... Uh, Tell her to get the fuck out. That's about all we can do. You know, you can't. Uh, we've been trying to get her sober. That doesn't work. She's been going to AA meetings with me since she was six years old. And she knows all about it, but uh, she just lacks the interest in staying sober. And, you know, I can understand that because I had the same thing when I got here. You know, I didn't, uh, I was willing to do anything except stay sober. And then uh, I was willing to do anything except work for it. You know, and that's uh, that combination will keep you right where you're at. So, uh, you know, today I'm uh, I'm willing to do anything in AA to uh, stay sober. I go to uh, I go to a minimum of three meetings a week, uh, whether I need to or not. It's it's not an option for me, and I have fun at all three of those. And then we uh, we also go to a couple other meetings off and on. So we, we get anywhere from three to five meetings a week, yeah, even though we've been sober a long time. And uh, that's so I can keep what I've got, because uh, it's a lot easier to stay sober than it is to get sober. And, uh, you know, after seeing people go back out, it's real easy to see. Mm -hmm. You know, I know people that uh, have gone back out and can't get back in, you know, desperately want it and can't get it. So it's it's not totally about wanting it. You know, that's a big help. But also, if you don't get the grace, you don't get it. So uh, it's been, uh, like I say, it's been really good. And, uh, there's a lot of things. Uh, uh, almost everything in my life has changed because of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I've got uh, I've got the ability to talk to people. I've got the ability to to help people and to be helped. Uh, I've got uh, uh, a way of making a living that I learned in Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I did get my car back after, you know, <laughs> after a few months. <laughs> after I rode a, a little 185 Yamaha motor scooter or motorcycle to meetings until uh, I, I could take it until about November in Detroit. And then it was, you know, you go like, 14 miles an hour and the wind chill factor is 400 below zero. <laughs> so, and then uh, that's when I got my car back. But, uh, you know, and then my sponsor said the, uh, the only thing sponsors say to you when you get your car back, good, how many people, how many newcomers can you get in it? Yeah. You know, unfortunately only one because it was a small car, but, uh, <laughs> but one's better than none. And, uh, you know, I went to meetings in, uh, in Detroit when there was blizzards you know, I was willing to go to any length there. I went to one meeting in, a, in the middle of a huge blizzard, and I had a thermos of coffee with me and a big book, 
pulled in the parking lot. The church was shut down. And there was one other knucklehead in a Jeep with a pot of coffee and a big book. And we got together and had a meeting, and that was it, you know. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, that's, uh, that's time for me. And uh, I'm grateful to be here and to be sober today. And thanks for asking me to speak here. It's been a good time. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.